Hello, dear wanderer. Relax, put down your things. That weapon will do you no good here. Allow me to bid you welcome to the halls of the Wanderer's Library. Around you, you will find that the towering shelves are stocked with every book that has been written, will be written, and many that ever will. Don't worry about the startling appearances of some of the other patrons. They respect the rules of the library, as I expect you to. Ah, where are my manners? I am the Round Repeat, eighth chief archivist of the Wanderer's Library. It is my duty to maintain and curate the vastest collection of knowledge in the cosmos. The librarians you may have seen, from the many-legged pages to the mouthless docents, work with me to ensure the library's rules are upheld and the collection remains intact. Don't be off by my appearances. I assure you, the manuals are purely for show. But you look to be quite tired, human. Entering the ways for the first time can take a lot out of you, little bipeds that you are. Rest assured, the library has extensive accommodations for those of our patrons who elect to live in our little infinity outside of reality proper. Housing, food, drink, you will be cared for here, for as long as you choose to remain in the stacks. Careful venturing deeper into the library, though. There are places not even I can guarantee your safety. Violence is forbidden inside the library, but there are worse fates than injury or death to be found here. But, as I said, so long as you remain in this central section, you will most likely be fine. Come, grab a hold of one of my abdomens. I will take you to a calm spot where I used to rest once. High above the shelves, overlooking everything from the sea of words to the main desk, you can sleep there for as long as you wish. It is a bit far, though. Allow me to entertain you with some stories as you fade to sleep. Heavenwards, History of Wall Walking by Muhammad Antigonus by Yasi Pasi. Wall Walking. It's an obscure but relatively common pastime among the younger batch of wanderers. Participants can come from any type of world or universe, but all tend to share the joys of heights, thrills, or adventure. Ascending the shelves of the infinite expanse above sounds frightening, but this group seeks to break records year after year, climbing as high as possible. But how did it all begin? Why do these daredevils dare to challenge the skies and rage against its supposed infinite length? The answers might be simpler than you'd think. Richard Iago was the first wall walker and lived some two to three hundred years ago. He was a known philosopher, scholar, literary analyst, author, scientist, and more. But his most impressive works were his poems describing the elegance and beauty of the library at large. Alas, it was none of these that ultimately sealed his name in the history books. Rather, it was his immense sportsmanship and dedication to wall walking that gained him his following and prestige. Mr. Iago, whilst in the middle of writing his newest poem about the eternity of literature, which has since been either lost or destroyed, noticed that there were no records at the top of the library or any attempts to find it. Sparked by this sudden intrigue, he discarded this poem in favor of another, adding the former to an ever-growing mound of crumpled papers next to his desk. This one, however, was completed and was shortly followed by Richard packing up his gear and heading for the nearest shelf two meters to his right. His first record was ultimately not that impressive a full 10-foot climb before falling backwards and twisting his ankle. Still, this did not shake his strong resolve, and a month later he was fully equipped with climbing gear and supplies. The first real record, he said, was a total of around 150 feet from the ground, or about 45 meters. A small crowd formed at the base of the ascent, and by the time he descended he had his own small cult following for this new idea. Among this crowd was Edward Claudius, who quickly became a disciple and competitor of Richard Iago. Edward, seeing potential in this new sport, set the next record at a grand total of 151 feet in the air, which prompted Richard to set an even newer record of 152 feet. This supposed teasing annoyed another follower of Richard, who sent the record soaring to 197 feet or 60 meters, and the race was on. What followed was the two frenemies battling out their highest climbs over a period of a few months, ultimately culminating with the highest record being 689 feet. 210 meters, set by Edward Claudius before his untimely demise. While attempting to set the 700-foot record, Mr. Claudius got his shoe stuck between two very heavy books and perished a week later from dehydration. 
In order to honor his friend, Mr. Iago refused to break the record and was subsequently only climbed 688 feet instead on his future endeavors. Richard Iago later died from alcohol poisoning when poison was slipped into his alcohol. By this point, wall walking was considered dead, a discarded fad that didn't have the life in it to keep going. Yet, like an amateur author on a collaborative writing website, it just kept coming back for more even though it knew better. Richard Iago's son, Ilya Miyago, was very different from his father. Instead of being a philosopher, scholar, literary analyst, author, scientist, and poet, Ilya was an athlete, which meant that he actually had a job. Finding his father's poems about the library's height and accounts of his rivalry with Mr. Claudius, Iago Jr. took it upon himself to revive the sport. 23 years after it was presumed dead, wall walking made a sudden, surprising revival. Ilium, using his previously established position in the library's community, gave the sport its official name and community. From there, he broke the first quadruple digit record of 1,000 feet, 305 meters, and trained a whole group of people in the art of climbing bookshelves without pissing off librarians. Using these abilities, the new wall walkers set off to find the highest record they could get for absolutely no reason. During this time, many key features of modern wall walking emerged from this primordial soup. Checkpoints were built, gear became standardized, and most importantly, the biennial wall walking Olympics. Participants could sign up for a three-day expedition into the not-that-great unknown and race the clock for the highest possible height achieved. In return, wall walkers had a small chance to win a signed autograph from Ilium himself on their inner calves. Signed autographs were illegal on cattle outside of farms. Most people, however, wanted the second place prize, plain old cash, ultimately resulting in aggressive attempts to be slightly better than mediocre, but not the absolute best they could be. Thanks to all these immense advances, records were broken every few months as professionals crossed the thousands and entered into the two thousands, then three thousands, then eventually decimal points above a single kilometer. To celebrate the momentous occasion, over a hundred wanderers gathered together under the original spot that Richard Iago twisted his ankle and threw a large party. It went about as well as any other party thrown in a library. Alas, the wall walking Olympics did not last forever, on the contrary, only eight years. By the third round, people from worlds where sapiens had wings would use their ability of flight to, at the last moment, gain an extra 500 or so feet, allowing them to essentially cheat the system. This made non-wingers very upset, who simply left to pursue non-competitive wall walking. Iago, realizing his mistake, banned the wingers from the Olympics, which made the pro-wingers very upset and prompted them to pursue non-competitive wall walking as well. The fourth wall walking Olympics had a grand total of three people participate one of which was Iago himself, and another which was also Iago himself, but smaller and with a mustache. The wall walking Olympics were promptly disbanded and the Iago name faded into the sands of time. From there, wall walking became more decentralized but soon found its golden age. This started with Jeremy Ford's discovery of the first dead zone, approximately a mile and a half from the floor of the library and about 3,000 feet from checkpoint one. The dead zones were large spherical areas in the sky where all librarians refused to enter. Adding to this was the fact that all books were blank, rotting, and seemed to shuffle positions every time they were alone. The dead zones were dark, mysterious, and eerie to all those who encounter them. Yet this has little relevance to the overall plot and will promptly be entirely ignored. Many took interest in what could be above the shelves though, and hundreds if not thousands flocked to become wall walkers soon after. It was during this longer period that the two mile record was broken, checkpoint two was established, and three more dead zones were discovered. A few famous scholars in the library even wrote about wall walking in their publications. These factors helped push wall walking into the mainstream and shaped it into what it is today. More strange things were discovered over time, a majority happening in the past decade. A famous example would be the Putos Monos village, meaning sacred abode village in most universes ancient Hebrew texts. Putos Monos village is a town located 6 kilometers from the library surface, inhabited mostly by sapient simians from multiple worlds, and is currently also the third highest checkpoint. However, this was not the most impressive thing about the strange town. Rather, it was the fact that Edward Claudius, who was presumed dead for over 200 years, was actually still alive. He had managed to climb high enough to enter Putos Monos, breaking the 6 kilometer record, then proceeded to become immortal through unknown means and live out his days as a poet. Richard Iago's body was found there, and it was being used as an infinite energy source for the village since it continuously spins for unknown reasons. 
Last year, 94 AR, the 226th anniversary of wall walking was celebrated by wall walkers from all walks of life, and the first 10 kilometer climb from surface level was achieved to celebrate the occasion. Many fun oddities were discovered along the way, including many strange books, wood, more wood, some toilet paper, a dead zone, and a coffin which contained only a single live bee. When the climbers reached the top, a few fainted, but thanks to the long fall and intense power napping skills, no one was ultimately hurt. The possibilities are endless when wall walking, so what are you waiting for? Ask your local Dawson on instructions to get to the nearest wall walk center, and they'll give you lessons on how to start your own little adventure into the skies. Maybe you'll even become one of the many legends I failed to talk about in this pamphlet, and also be forgotten alongside them. This is your journey. Who knows what the skies have in store for you? Probably bird poop. Idolatry by Din Bidor. In the age of the Haita, before the ways were open to mortal men, there was a city in the farthest reaches of the world, its great form looming over the land of Lormun. Tevak of the Red Sands was its name, for it had been erected amidst the red dunes of the Ohmar. Tall and mighty were its walls, its towers, its spires, built from star substance, pale and hard unlike any rock on the land. Colossal were its temples, palaces for the nameless idols that watched over the darkness, carved with glyphs and names in tongues unknown, and silent were its streets, walked only by ghosts and wind, for though it could have housed a thousand thousand men, Tavak was as empty as a starless night over the Sea of Dunes. Thus was Tavak known as an aberration, a city built but never inhabited, a child born but never claimed. No one knew whose hands had erected it, none could tell for how long it had stood. All the people of the land understood, nevertheless, a knowledge vested on them since words had meaning, since the first of men had arrived on the fertile banks of Lormun, that the city's name was Tavak, and that it stood silently amidst the red sands of the Ahmar. And with this knowledge, the people knew dread, for though empty and unclaimed, still Tavak remained unspoiled, its walls unmoved by the rage of the elements, its towers strong as if they knew not the ravages of time, its streets clean as if built the night before. It was, they said, as if something, something older than man, older than the world, had died and given birth atop its corpse to the empty spires and palaces of Tavak, to its dark temples and cavernous houses, and still kept watch over its spawn. And all the while, silence, like an omen, reigned, and so city came to be known as Tavak, the silent city of the Red Sands. For millennia untold, Tavak remained deserted, unclaimed by people or empire, its dreadful stillness unmolested. But the will of men is strong, and from the north one day came down a strong, hardy people born in a place called Erheta. Exiled from their home by sword and magic, they wandered through the desert, begging and trading and praying and fighting to survive. Upon arriving on the land, they were rejected, turned away in every city and village for the men of Erheta were gray of skin and blue of eyes, and the people of the land thought them demons from beyond the stars. Thus, the men of Erheta were forced to take refuge on Tavak, for it was, like them, unwanted and unclaimed. The men of Erheta entered the city, shuddering as elder walls breathed out the dread silence of yore, as the terrible stillness of its stone houses and palaces welcomed them past the arched gates. They looked in fear and fascination at the uninhabited buildings, at the vacant squares and gardens, at the desolate temples shrouded in darkness. They trembled as they realized their solitude amongst the edifices, the absence of those who had built Tavak, if it had been built at all. Thus was the first night spent in Tavak, and the second, and the third, and so on and so forth. And though they still feared the star-spawned stone and its drowning silence, the men of Erheta laid claim to the walls and houses and made the city their home. And at last, Tavak's squares and palaces were lit with homely fires, and its streets filled with great crowds of gray flesh and azure eyes. And the silence ended, and the city lived, and the people of Erheta knew peace and joy. And for the time, Tavak the silent became Tavak the mirthful, and for a time, all was good. The age of Haitha marched on, cities grew and men multiplied. The people of Erheta remembered their old name no longer, known now to themselves and to others as the people of Tavak. The men of Tavak the Mirthful carved a great empire through the desert, the ancient city their seat of power. 
Their conquest of the place believed cursed by the others had emboldened them, and out they went, conquering and to conquer. By force of blade and coin, the other cities and kingdoms of the land bent their knee to Tavak, and within a few years all who had denied the men of Ur had to pay tribute to the gray-skinned, blue-eyed lords of the once silent city of the Red Sands. Tavak grew mightier still. Its people, fed by the abundant crops they sowed, became so numerous that, if they all sang in unison, their voices would reach the heavens. Its riches, collected from across the land, were so many that their glistening could be seen from several miles in the distance, and Tavak the Mirthful became known to every merchant and traveler as Tavak the Glistening, the gem city of the Ohmar. As Tavak's power grew, so did its people's pride, and the silence which had once ruled over the city passed into myth, a tale to scare children at dusk. And little by little, the memory of the first night on Tavak was barred from the minds of the gray-skinned, azure-eyed men, as was that which had transpired during the taking of the city. And in the vaults deep below the city, locked away from the sight of men, something long forgotten stirred. One morning, a great cry echoed through the dunes, a lamentation unlike any ever heard by men. Under the shadowy dawn of the newborn day, the people of the land saw a gasp of the turning of the heavens had brought, and shuddered. The people of Tavak, from richest of nobles to the lowliest of peasants, had vanished. Where last night the streets had been crowded, the fires lit, and the temples full of worshippers, now stood solely the mighty metropolis of stone, as silent as the day it had been before the arrival of the men of Erheta. No use was it that men and beasts dug deep into the arid ground, that search parties ventured deep into the city and far into the desert endlessness. That people cried and prayed and begged for deliverance. The city was empty, and none remained to tell the tale. And Tavak the glistening, gem of the Ohmar, became Tavak the silent anew. The whispers of the fate that had befallen Tavak traveled far and wide across the lands of man. Every soul heard and despaired at the vanishing of the city's inhabitants, gone in the blink of an eye as if their lives had been but a mirage. People turned to the heavens, to the desert, looking for answers and received none. Many rumors circled about the cause of the vanishing, each wilder than the previous. Some said that the sorcerer-priests of Tavak had offended their gods, bringing about divine judgment that had smoked the city and all who lived there into the void beyond. Others still thought that the sands had opened up and swallowed Tavok, spitting back out the empty city and retaking that which had always been their right. None dared utter the word, the fearful possibility that something other, something elder, ancient, had awoken in the depths of the city, something that had always been there before the men of Urheta had claimed the city as their own. None wished to remember the silence, the stillness. Days passed and became weeks, weeks passed and became years, until Tavak was nothing but a distant memory, its history and fate interwoven with legend, shifting as it spread from mouth to mouth. Whatever gray-skinned people remained, they became pariahs in the new world, shunned as their ancestors had once been, cast out in fear that they brought with them whatever curse had caused their home to be wiped clean of life. None wished to share the fate of the gem of the Ohmar. And for the longest of times, none dared set foot on the corpse city of Tavak of the Red Sands. Centuries passed and the world went on, as life often does in the aftermath of catastrophe. Empires were born, expanded, and fell. Earthquakes and storms scourged the land. Seasons came and went. And still, Tavak remained abandoned beyond the banks of Lormun. The mystery of its people's vanishing left unanswered. For the wise men and adventurers from across the land had come to see the city, none could bear to enter its walls and face the great metropolis of stone that had swallowed its populous whole. And the silence went on and on. One night, however, the voice spread that the fires of Tabak were lit, and that murmurs emerged from the city, whispers carried by the roaring desert wind. From beyond the walls, a shrill chanting was heard, a litany of voices not unlike the men who had inhabited Tabak glistening. The sound rose at night as the sun fell and faded away as the new day dawned, as if those who howled and sung their supplications could only ever do it at the cover of night. Frightened by the sudden haunting of the dead city, the men of Lormoon spent but a few days deliberating on what to do. The chanting unmistakably meant that something again lived within the city's walls. What it was, the men could not tell. 
No one had yet come out the gates of Tavak to announce their claim to the city. No movement besides the nightly fires had been observed. Whomever or whatever had moved into the silent city of the Red Sands wished not to extend a hand in friendship or a blade in enmity. It seemed, the men thought, that the city was now truly inhabited solely by wraiths and shades of ages past. The chanting went on every night, fires lit like a thousand stars in the shroud of darkness. Dread crept through the hearts and minds of the people of Lormoon, as even the winds howling could not drown out the horrid litany. Dread crept through the hearts and minds of the people of Lormoon, as even the winds howling could not drown out the horrid litany, the maddening roar of a thousand thousand voices prostrate in worship of the unseen. The silence was gone, its absence filled by the cries, the echoes of rituals unknown. And every night, as the chanting rose from the corpse city, the people dreamt. The dream spread through the lands like a plague, madness swirling from the deepest recesses of the mind, from the dark primal corners of memory. It burned a blight upon the souls of those who found it in their slumber. In the numbness of the abyss they found not release, but the waiting horror of the plague, of the sickness of the mind. They saw the face, the eyes, the gaping mouth, from whence came black words of doom. They whimpered and begged for help, even as they were defiled, devoured, but none could wake them, not even as their eyes opened in the light of the day revealed to them, not to have returned from the dreamlands, but to be perpetually entombed in the nightmare's screaming maw. To close one's eyes was to commit one's mind to lunacy and chaos. Cities burned and kingdoms fell, the tide of madness ravaging the known world. The raving crowds dancing their orgiastic celebration of death and bloodshed, corpses littering the streets, the temples, the desert itself. Blackened words were uttered, supplications to forces unknown to bring about collapse and oblivion. Sorcerers and priests and scholars tried to stop the plague, the dream, to tear it from the minds of men root and stem. But the sickness, like a weed, grew back a tenfold stronger, fingers digging into flesh and eyes gouged out in monstrous celebration of its triumph. The land was sown with salt and the sky blotted out with rising ash. At last, the men of the land turned to the source of the madness, the corpse city of Tavak of the Red Sands, its walls and streets occupied by the enemy unseen, the bringers of the plague. With what weapons they could fashion, the surviving men of the land of Lormoon mounted their last stand, a hundred of their kin venturing past the shadowed gates of Tavak and into the unknown, off to slay whatever fiend had brought doom upon the land. Inside the city walls, all was quiet, for the day Astra had yet to hide behind the horizon. Long shadows were cast by the colossal stone buildings, black spaces where a man could be swallowed whole by dark of dusk. Steps echoed throughout the empty city as the men advanced through the streets towards the great square they knew to lie at the center of Tavak. There they hoped to find the cause of their ills and strike it down. Minutes turned to hours as the men walked on but found themselves no closer to the city center. The sun went out over the horizon and the cold moon cast its light over the city. But the march continued still as the city itself changed in unnerving forms, eerie shapes not of earthly origin that grew stranger and stranger as the troop headed deeper into Tavok's bowels. Buildings stretched to heights impossible, piercing the heavens until they became lost amidst the darkness of night. Houses and palace melted into one another, fused in horrid fashion as if made of living tissue and not cold, lifeless stone. Doors and windows, steps and wells formed haphazardly, emerging from walls and floors and ceilings with no apparent order or design. The city's streets, once orderly and efficient despite their vacancy, had turned maze-like, an incoherent labyrinthine abomination of dead ends and meandering corridors. And all the while, the chanting echoed throughout Tavak. Closer, the men seized not their advance, though they shook with horror and confusion at the maddening sights that had replaced the silent city. Deeper they went, even as some of their number went missing in the branching maze, in the darkened corridors lit only by moonlight and dying torches. Closer. The chanting grew louder as the men finally reached what could be none other than the center of Tavak, and found the horror waiting for them. A throng of grey figures chanted and danced around a great blazing pyre, 
mouths voicing the horrid words of doom that spilt forth from the people maddened by the plague of dreams. Their faces were misshapen, eyeless, black orifices where their blue orbits had once known the light of day. They raised their arms towards the sky, towards the shadows that watched over their feast, over their sacrifice. Looming shapes of pale visages made from the same starborn stone that the city itself. To them, they raised their prayers, their supplications, their sacrifices. The chanting was as loud as thunder, but only strong enough to barely drown out the other sound. The noise that came from the adjacent buildings and walls and the floor itself, as the men of Lormoon slowly realized they stood not on polished stone of skilled craftsmanship, but on heterogeneous mass of writhing limbs and screaming mouths, gray skin barely distinguishable from the space rock in which they were embedded, fused to the stone as a coral to the seabed. On it, the men of Lormoon had treaded, and only now, at the zenith of the entombed's agony, did they realize the fate of the inhabitants of Tavak, the once men come from Arhetha. The creatures that had been the rulers and inhabitants of Tavak wailed and threw themselves about the air and ground, their frenzy reaching climax even as the horrified men of Lormoon raised against them blade and pike, as their flesh was rent and their bones shattered. And over the blood spilt and the creatures slain, over the climaxing dancers and fearful slayers, over the writhing ground and the screaming walls, watched the stone faces of the idols of Tavak, the ancient things that had long awakened from their slumber in the catacombs below. And the screams died out and the fire burnt bright, and thus silence reigned again over Tavak. It transpired that the men of Lormoon found truth as they extinguished the last of the eyeless worshippers, as their blades drew the last blood. How this knowledge had been vested upon them they did not understand, but it had arisen in their hearts with the once men of Arhetha, then Tavak had strived to hide, to stamp out of history and remembrance, the truth of their first night amidst the silence of Tavak. The men of Arhetha had found Tavak as empty as could be, not a single soul, not of their kin, breathed in the dead of night. Fearful but decided, they ventured deep into the great metropolis of stone and shuddered and wondered at its magnificence. But the stone houses and palaces of Tavak were cold and unwelcoming, unable or unwilling to host the likes of man. And so, the men of Arhetha had been forced to seek sanctuary in the temples of the nameless gods of Tavak, at whose feet a brazier could be lit and fire summoned against the freezing darkness. Still, they looked upon the visages of the idols who presided over the city they gazed, and their empty, polished eyes gazed back at them, filling the people with woe. Among these pale, nameless colossi, one stood out an effigy chiseled into the image of a woman. Her blank orbs stared blindly into the void, her arms extended as if receiving worshippers into her embrace, but her hands were like talons, her limbs thin like dead branches. Her mouth was agape, a serpent uncoiling from the orifice like a dreadful spell uttered in the primordial bareness of the sanctum. Silent she stood, like her city, wondrous and dreadful to behold. The men of her had the new fear in their hearts as they looked upon the woman, upon the mother of Tavak, and with haste they lashed at her, tearing the statue from its pedestal, though they dared not to shatter her under the strike of hammer or club. Unbroken, it was carried out of the temple, spat on and cursed by the fearful people, and buried deep within the darkest vault of the voiceless city, locked away to be forgotten by generations to come. In time, every idol in every temple in Tavak had been torn down and thrown into the catacombs below the silent city of the Red Sands, replaced by the deities of the men of Urheta, who were fairer in their eyes than the terrible effigies that had once lined the temples of the silent city. Unto them they offered sacrifice, enshrined in the old sanctums so that they may be adored by natives and visitors, by priests and common folk alike. Upon their images were the best crops offered, the most tender sheep slaughtered, the most haunting songs chanted, so that their power held against the idols who, in their slumber, still aimed to retake that which had once been theirs. But man is frail, and not even their faith may hold against the remembrance of sin and heresy. And so, the strange idols of Tavak stirred in slumber, shared their dream with the usurpers, to drive the nail of madness deep into the hearts of men. And as the people dreamt, they faded from this world, sinking into the depths of the cursed dream space of the ancient stone, 
cast into the maelstrom of madness that lied beneath the waking world. And now, as ages passed and men grew bolder, as the memory of Tavok turned to myth, they returned changed, molded in the image of the blind idols of star spawn stone. With their tongueless mouths and eyeless orbits, they would sing and witness, dance and worship, sharing their dream with the rest of the waking world to serve the blind, silent wills of the nameless idols of Tavak of the Red Sands. And the dream would take root, and the world would know madness. With this knowledge did the men of Lormund return from the bowels of Tavak. With this knowledge did they burn the remains of the once men of Urheta, shattered and buried their idols deep in the desert, where they would be forever lost among the red sands of the Ahmar. And when the deed was done and the stone necropolis was again silent and empty, the men of Lormun returned to Tavak and razed the city to the ground. No stone was left upon stone, no house left standing, no temple left undefiled. All was torn down, all was destroyed. After two days and a morning, Tavak was no more. On the place where it once stood in the desert, a gray monolith, the only stone left intact, presided over the land, a tombstone for the great necropolis of Yor. And the red sands, ever silent, shifted. The stars have started to come out. I can see them through the cracks in the ceiling. Used to be that on nights like this, I'd be up in the eastern tower watching them. I had one of those big brass telescopes that the academy uses, with the knobs on the right side and the crooked stand. Grandfather had imported it from Changzhou for my 11th birthday. Only the heavens know how he was able to get a traitor to a land that far off. That telescope was something else. I was able to see the image of all the stars on the horizon, there were big stars, little stars, flashy stars, and the distant objects that Grandfather told me were the moons and planets. Many nights would end with me fast asleep in front of it, a celestial book in my lap, and a pudgy young face resting against the viewing piece. Grandfather said that these weren't really the stars, just the images, the memories of how they looked long past. It was an honor, he said, to be able to gaze upon such a storied history. I remember one night, Grandfather took me out to the courtyard to watch the stars fall. It was beautiful. They danced and twirled through the sky, a seemingly endless supply of brilliance and color. They flashed and pulsed with light, as if they had been waiting for me to put on a show. Although I begged him for months and months, we never went out there again. Even if it was only one trip, the image of the stars frolicking swiftly throughout the cosmos has stayed ingrained in my mind. When I became head of the castle, there was no more nonsense like that. I was a grown-up and there was to be no funny business on my watch. I made sure my own son was given the greatest education in the land and given tutelage in the widest birth of material. But for the study of the cosmos, we learned with each other. He and I would crowd around that dusty old telescope, keeping close watch on the heavens and their constellations. I miss him now more than ever. When he was lost to the family, the entire nation seemed to grieve. All my defenders were sent to search, and when he was found broken and still at the border, there were no words that could describe my grief. I was despairing, and in this state I demanded retribution. The defenders took up my banner, and we attacked those we believed to have wronged us. We ravaged them with our hate, destroying every man, woman, and child. We felt justice had been done. But the heavens did not smile as we smote our enemy. When they saw us driving them from their land and slaughtering them in greater numbers than had ever been seen, it was too much to bear. The heavens descended on us, first in small number, then greater. So many stars that I had once seen flittering about the vast frontiers came down to us, breaking everything we had. The flashing of light could be seen for many miles when they fell, and we found ourselves suffering a worse fate than our tormentors. I do not know why I was married. Perhaps to serve as a living legacy to the folly of my kingdom, or perhaps to bear witness to the end of a dynasty. When the time comes, I will go to the tower one last time and look over the vast emptiness of the land that I once ruled. The stars look beautiful tonight.
And that's all I have for you today. Come, you look. What's the word? Ah, sleepy. Have my stories bored you such? No, no, I just... It's quite alright. You little things need your rest. Hop off, this is the place. Wonderful, isn't it? A nice little nest to cozy up in. Go on and drift off. When you wake up, you'll be able to find your way back to the main hall. Just pick a direction and start walking. Until then, good night, wanderer. Restful dreams.